Musicianship Mindset Strategy, a guide to orchestral auditions. So the first thing you should know is that it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. The audition process, you know, some people have uh, romanticized notions about it, uh, but usually from the outside looking in, it's a lot of black magic and secrecy and question marks that we have. And, and that really only goes away when you sit on the other side of the screen, and I've sat on the other side of the screen as much, if not more, than most people ever have or ever will. I heard most of the brass section of the uh, Seattle Symphony during my tenure there. Uh, a number of trumpet auditions, including two principal trumpet auditions, a number of trombone auditions, including two principal trombone auditions, a number of horn auditions, including three principal horn auditions. The list goes on and on and on. And during those audition processes, I learned more about how to take an audition uh, by hearing what was successful on the other side of the screen than all the lessons that I ever took from my teachers. And I had a lot of great teachers. I've been blessed to be, uh, have, have had the opportunity to study with the very best of the best around the world for many years. It's, it's, I've been lucky that way. And I took a lot of good things away from them. If I could put my finger on one teacher that, that was, I would credit my success with, it was Joe Alessi. Because in the first lesson I ever took with him when I was at Juilliard School, he said, well, you know, there's no real big secret to winning an audition. Just don't sound bad. <laughs> in, in that inimitable in, in way that Joe oversimplifies everything with Joe speak, and he creates an army of Joe bots, but they're very successful. And I thought to myself, yeah, of course, don't sound bad. But he was right. The, the beauty and simplicity of that statement is that's really what it's all about. Don't sound bad. Auditions are a job interview, and you need to understand that. It's a job interview. So if you think about most job interviews outside of, of, of auditions, whether for a band or for an orchestra or what have you, they're a job interview. Uh, and they're not always keyed or geared to what we perceive in, in mainstream society as fair. It's about getting the best candidate for that company. Well, orchestra audition is no different. The committee's job is to quickly and efficiently, which is key, reduce the number of candidates to a manageable number for the music director. When I auditioned in Cincinnati, uh, when that job came open in 2015, they received 250 plus resumes and they narrowed it down for live auditions to 146 that they invited to attend for the live audition. 144 of them showed up. And every single candidate played every single note for every round including the finals and superfinals behind the screen. So it, it, it was a model of efficiency, but efficiently is the key. You want to get it down to a manageable number, let's say a half dozen, or a, let's say a dozen in the semifinals, and then five or six or less in the finals, assuming that you've got uh, enough qualified candidates. Every committee is looking for the best musician, not the best player. Now I'm going to speak to that in a second. It's already to assume, though, that the winner will be extremely proficient. I can tell you right now with a straight face and not a bit of guilt in my heart when I say that both jobs that I won, I was not the best player at that audition. There's no doubt in my mind. I was the best prepared. And my strategy is what led me to prevail uh, over the other candidates. But it wasn't because I was a better tuba player, in, 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 in quotes, or a better whatever, French horn, trumpet, trombone. It's not about being the best player. You better be a great player. Don't walk into an audition and think that you can substitute great playing for something else. You still have to be a, a, a highly proficient player. But if you go there, and this is something that I think is really important, you have to understand. If you go in there and you want to be judged as a technician, you will be. And guess what? Every one of you that go in playing with that mindset will fall short of the mark. Because going in to play as a technical player is the, the benchmark is going to be perfection, and no one's capable of that. No one is capable of playing perfectly. So if you want to be judged from a technical standpoint, standpoint, rest assured that you will be judged purely on your technical ability, and you'll fall short, and you will not win an audition. You'll probably not even be successful in advancing. But if you want to go in there and be the best musician, well, you, might, you, you now have a fighting chance, because no committee can take away your musicianship. Even under the stress of an audition where you're freaked out, 
if you've cultivated your musical skills, they'll be with you when you're when the chips are down. All right. They're not rooting for you. Get this through your head. No, no, one, no one is like, boy, I hope everyone comes in and plays well. Quite the opposite. C number one, efficiently. I'm not rooting for every person. I don't sit there and listen. And I can tell you, this is the, the vast majority of people in every community that I've sat with. Maybe 95 or more percent of the people that I've served on committees with, we're not sitting there rooting for the underdog. Oh, you know, okay, they just biffed that excerpt. And this one sounds nothing like the actual piece. But let's give them a third excerpt to play because maybe, just maybe, they'll convince us. No, we have a certain contractual number that we have to listen to, a certain number of excerpts. And if, it's, if they're not even close, we let them go. I, I'm sorry, this is business. It, it's not fair. It's, it's the cold, cruel world. So they're not rooting for you. They're looking for any excuse to cut you loose. So keep that in mind. That, that sounds terrible. But it doesn't have to be. Now, the next thing you need to cultivate as a, as a player is mindset. Mindset is probably 75% or more of taking an audition or, or a successful performance. It's going there with a proper mindset. Because you ever heard the saying, where the mind goes, the body follows? If you, if you are thinking about how much you're dreading going out and getting up at like 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning and putting on a sousaphone in like sub-zero temperatures so that you can march, your body's going to feel really bad. Or if you haven't prepared for a test or an exam and you walk into class, you're going to feel, going to feel bad about that. You know, wherever, if your mind's in a bad place, your body's going to feel bad. But if you, if you have a positive mindset, you can overcome a lot of obstacles. So how do we cultivate that mindset? Audition winners aren't accidentally successful. This comes as, as, should come as no surprise, but people say, well, this person was lucky and they won the audition. You make your own love. You know, I mean, I believe in a higher power, and it has nothing to do with luck. You know, uh, what does I say? Chance favors the prepared. Well, when you go an audition, there shouldn't be any, any chance. There shouldn't be any room for chance. You should have engineered that out of the practice room. Uh, audition winners aren't afraid of anything on the list or any part of the audition process. Regardless of the, of the type of audition or the repertoire you're playing, if you go in, if there's an excerpt that you're hoping they won't ask, Rest assured, that's the one that the job will hinge upon. So you should come in with a, you, you've got to challenge yourself to have this mindset. I literally can't wait for them to ask every single excerpt because every single excerpt I've prepared in such a way that it's just one more way for me to demonstrate that I am that much better and more prepared and that much more the person for this job. I hope they ask every single one of them because every excerpt will give me that much more of an edge over every competitor. Now, that seems like bluster, but you've got to talk yourself into that. You, and and it's, it, it, it's not just talk, it comes from preparation. Okay, audition winners have a plan for every note of every excerpt. See number two. There shouldn't be any excerpt that you haven't developed a plan and that you're hoping they don't ask. Cultivating mindsets. When you go to an audition, you may be going with five or six of your buddies or seven or ten. Or you might, oh, I can't wait to see this person from X, Y, and Z. No. I'm sorry. You can be friends after the audition. But when you talk about, let's just say a top ten orchestra where you're, you're making six figures. If you w win that job, it's like winning the lottery. I've, I'm in my 20, I've made millions of dollars. Now, I'm not saying that to brag, but I mean, that's the reality. You are there to try and win the lottery. Now, it's not winning the lottery because it's not chance, but it's, it, there's a lot of, and, and even if we're talking about a $50,000 a year job, that's a million dollars over, over, over 20 years, right? So you don't have any friends at auditions. You're not there to like hang around. You're there to audition for the job. Nothing is personal. This is, this is important too. Nothing is personal during the audition prep or during the audition. If someone asks you to do something behind the screen, you've put all of your, your time and energy into to executing your plan, but if they say, I want this note lo long and you play it short, and they say, I, I, can you play it long? Well, that's not how I think it should go. Let go of it. Just play it, give them what they ask, convince them. Don't take it personally. And if you don't win, and this is really important too, you're going to feel bad. I get it. Everybody feels bad. I've, I've been on successful auditions, but don't take it personally. It doesn't make you a bad person because you didn't win that audition. And this is really important. That's probably the most, if you take away anything I say today, 
don't beat yourself up because you didn't do well in an audition. That is not a testimony to your worth as a person. It just means you're unsuccessful. There's a lot of things that we try and, and fail at. Um, be the best prepared candidate in every way you can think of. And, and there's a lot of ways, but you know, we'll get on it in a second, but think about, do some research. If, if you know where their hall is, if you can go and play in their hall, you know, or go hear them play concerts, before you take an audition where you're going to play and it gives you an op you know, opportunity to have an idea of what the acoustic is like, go do it. Everything that you could possibly think of. If they have a recording of a piece of music that's on the audition list, you better own it. Not necessarily you need to go and play it the way they played it in the recording because they might hate the conductor and they may say, yeah, he played it like, you know, like X, Y, and Z conductors. Man, I hated that interpretation. But at least you need to know how they play a particular piece. So when I say in every way that you can think of, believe me, leave no stone unturned. Always cheat, always win. So cheating, when I say cheat in quotes, if there's a certain technique or a way to play, I'm going to use a, a, a controversial topic, the shifted low register. You know, shifted low registers is a controversial topic. And yet, uh, and you, don't, you certainly don't need it. I'm, you know, as someone who's a proponent for it, I'm going to tell you, you don't need it. But um, if it comes down to when you've got certain excerpts or certain notes on the page that you want to know are money in the bank every single time and more solid and secure than most everybody else that plays with a non-shifted lower register, and you want to avail yourself of that, even though your teachers may have told you you shouldn't play like that, if that's cheating and you've got some misguided sense of you know fairness in an audition, if you want to disallow yourself to use that, but I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it because I'm going to beat you. I, I don't care. It's, just, it's not personal. I'm here to beat you or you and you and you and you and you. So always cheat, always win. They, you know, that's a mantra that they, they talk about in gunfighting. There are no rules in a gunfight except have a gun, right? So, but auditions aren't exactly the same thing, but they're, they can be just about as, as hair-raising and, and stressful as a gunfight. Uh, okay, kind of, kind of kidding there. Strategy. So here's a couple of rules for auditions. Never voluntarily show weakness. So I'll, I'll give you an illustration of one. Like, you know, I've got, you know, a 12-pack here. I've been working on it for years. I'm pretty proud of it, the tone chamber. And if I'm walking down the street and I see someone, you know, that, that I don't want to think, I don't want them to think that I'm, you know, a, a, a slovenly pig. When I see them, if, if I see them before they see me, I'm, I go from this to this. <laughs> and as soon as they're gone, it goes back to this. This is, this is what tenured Chris looks like, right? This is what tenured does. So, never voluntarily show weakness in an audition. We're going to talk about that in a second. Rule number two, know the stereotypes of your instrument and be prepared to defy them. If you could pick one stereotype that most, most non-tuba players, when, when that nice old lady comes up and asks you when you're carrying the tuba or you just got done playing a tuba and she says, boy, that thing sure takes a lot of what to play. Air. Air. Okay, that's a stereotype. Now, that's, it's, it's a stereotype, but it's not. Yeah, it takes a lot of air to play the tuba. But if, if everyone that you're playing for in a, in a tuba audition is a non-tuba player, they're going to be subscribing to and expecting the stereotypes. So you've got to know, you've got to be honest about what those stereotypes are and have a plan for defying them in the process of your preparation for the audition. Uh, Rule number three, have a plan and checklist for every excerpt. So the plan is basically your overarching idea for how you're going to do things. A musical plan, phrasing, articulation, dynamics, tempo, style, all of those. But a checklist is how you go to implementing your plans. Like, I'm a pilot. Every time I go out to the airplane on the, on the, on the uh, tarmac, when I open the door of the airplane, the first thing I do is there's a spiral notebook that I pull out, and it's the checklist. And I start from page one, and I go and I put my finger and say out loud and touch every switch and knob of everything that I'm supposed to do in that airplane for my pre-flight checklist. And then I do my before takeoff checklist, and then I do my 
S, you know, my climb out checklist, and I do my cruise checklist, and I do my descent checklist, and I do my pre-landing checklist, and then there's emergency checklists. Checklists are effective, and they're often overlooked. And, and I think that that's to your detriment, because what they do is they give you a task to focus on when things are not going well. I'm going to give you a, a morbid story. How many of you how many of you have ever listened to uh, cockpit voice recorders of doomed flights? So the, the thing that I, I do as a pilot, because I want to know what went wrong. I want to know what went wrong. In, in the vast majority of, of those cockpit voice recorder recordings, if it's a commercial airline and a professional crew, they're calm and cool and collected all the way to the end. They go down running the checklist. Because that's their job. What, else, what other choice do they have? If they give up, they have no chance. But if they keep running the, che the checklist, and there are multiple sins. Captain Sullenberger, he ran the checklist to tremendous effect, right? He, he ran that checklist all the way into the Hudson River and saved all those people. God bless them. But those checklists, now the, the only time, the, the exception is when the, the pilots stop running a checklist and just before you just before the recording ends, they start screaming because they've realized there's there's no chance. But they've given up. So have a checklist because when you're sitting there on stage, every excerpt, if it has a checklist for getting ready to play it, and while you're running it, you're running that checklist concurrently with your plan, it gives you something to focus on other than what other people are thinking, what's going through your mind, all the possibilities. So have a checklist. Rule number four, and this is probably the most important for strategy, is music is the solution to every problem. So in your practice room, when you're pre preparing excerpts, overall, it sounds like a vast oversimplification, but it's not. Always look for a musical solution to the weaknesses that you're trying not to show. And, and by and large, you'll find that there's a musical solution for just about anything that you have to do, except for a musical solution to not practicing. Well, okay, there's no solution for that. Routinely assess your strengths and weaknesses honestly. Be honest with yourself. If you, if you know that you don't have a good low register, you should probably work on that. If you don't feel like you're good at playing soft, you should probably work on that. The vast majority of, of us, me included, Go in the practice, practice room and keep practicing the things that we do well. And that's a total waste of time. The things that you do well, you'll probably always do well. Or if you stop doing them well, you can refocus on them and they'll come back pretty much in short order. But we need to be honest about what we can do. Then prioritize them. What do you do the worst? If your high register is the worst aspect of your playing, spend some time working on your high register. If your soft playing is the, is the problem, spend, spend more time on that. But have a, a prior, uh, prioritization for your, your weaknesses. And, and prioritize your strengths as well. Put them down closer to the bottom of the list. They need less attention because of their strengths. Analyze each excerpt and which strength or weakness it highlights. If there's a particular excerpt that highlights, a, a, let's say it's soft playing. In your practice routine, away from the excerpts, and this is important, away from the excerpts, practice soft playing. We'll get, we'll get to that in a second, too. Uh, develop a plan for each excerpt that showcases your strengths and minimizes your weakness. Let's use Mahler 1 as an example. Mahler 1 is, is relatively, it's the hardest easy excerpt I know of. Uh, because it's, I mean, it's, it's a hard, quote-unquote, easy excerpt. And people think of it as a soft excerpt. And so what do they do when they go into audition? They play it too soft. Well, this is one of these things. You better have practiced it soft. You better have some soft money in your bank when it comes to playing these excerpts, but in the heat of battle, don't go and roll out and try and play something softer than you can in an audition. That's, that's, the, that's a rookie move. It's like, well, this is a soft excerpt. And when you're stressed out and you're nervous in an audition, what is your predilection? Are you going to connect with your softest playing magically that one moment? Uh-uh. Probably even your softest playing is not going to be available to you at that moment. Make a safety move. If, if the committee wants to hear it softer, that's their option. Don't play it forte, 
but don't play, don't show them your hand. Don't show them your softest playing because probably you won't even come up with that in audition. So that's an example of, you know, not showing weakness voluntarily. Okay. Uh, constantly perform the excerpt for listeners. This is really important. We do a lot of times, you know, we'll sit there and practice excerpts over and over and over and over, but we just practice them with a, an analytical mindset. But when we get in an audition, that's when we start listening. For the first time, a lot of times people, the first time they hear themselves actually playing, in other words, they're, they're actually just tuned into what's coming out of their bell as opposed to what's happening with the metronome and with a tuner on the stand or with their teacher beating them over the head. It's a surprise to them. And when you're in the heat of battle, do you ever have a thought that you sound good? Raise your hand if you've ever been you know, on stage nervous as heck and thought, wow, I sound awesome. <laughs> never, never. You're usually hypercritical. And that's, that's as a result of you not being used to that kind of mindset or that mental process that goes on when you're performing. The difference between practicing and then playing for somebody else when you know that they're listening and they're being critical of you, it's a big difference. So you need to get in the habit, probably more than even practicing by yourself, grab somebody. Make that poor slob listen to you play the excerpt. And, you know, rotate through your buddies at school so they don't hate you or turn around and run the opposite direction when they see you coming down the practice room with your tuba. Hey, uh, no. Uh, uh, but, yeah, get in the performance mindset. This is a pet peeve of mine. Own. Own. Not what's your favorite YouTube version. Own and listen to multiple high-quality recordings of each excerpt. See if there are trends in the interpretation and related to tempi and style of a particular excerpt. If it's Bruckner 7, you better have four or five different recordings of Bruckner 7. Don't just have one by one conductor by one orchestra. Have listened to enough of them and owned them and really lived with them and understand what the overarching style of a particular piece is. I'm going to give you a little bit of a... Of, of a Inside baseball, if you want to listen to a great Burton recording, don't buy the New York Philharmonic, don't buy Chicago Symphony, don't get a Cleveland Orchestra recording. That's great. Those recordings are great. They are not the right style. Go get a, a, a European, preferably a German or Viennese orchestra recording of Bruckner, and pro preferably more than one. But yeah, I ask people, because have you ever heard a recording of this piece that you're playing an excerpt for me from? Well, no. I said, well, how do you even know it goes? Well, I've listened to recordings on YouTube. Well, what's your favorite orchestra? I don't know. Number one on the YouTube list. <laughs> well, that could be, a, literally, could be a community orchestra. And, and I don't know how many times that people have listened to recordings of, of high school concert band recordings because that's the only one they could find. That, that I hate that. So, I'm sorry. Rant mode off. Ask yourself if your plan for each excerpt falls within the above-mentioned trends. Avoid extremes of interpretation unless it's for a desired effect. There's times and places to go to extremes, but it's usually pretty rare. Like if we're talking about Prokofiev 5, don't carve out the very slowest tempo that you've ever heard in a recording because you're going to fall apart and you're going to breathe after every note and you're going to sound stupid. And that goes back to voluntarily showing weakness. That's an unforced error in the baseball lingo. Okay, and remember, just don't sound bad. The methodologies of playing. I've practiced the excerpts the way that I've heard them play and the way that I play them. And I, I'm going to try and like give you a, a little bit of insight towards what's been successful for me and what hasn't been successful for other people. Just as a point of reference, I just got through judging 56 some odd tapes for the iTech uh, mock orchestral audition, me and John DeCesar and Mike Roylance. Uh, and we got all these blind tapes, just with numbers on them, and there was a set number of excerpts on them. And I don't know ultimately how many have advanced because it's all it's all secret. I submitted on a website. I don't know who's who. I just vote for, vote for my numbers. And there's you know they put all they they crunch the numbers and people will be contacted. I don't know when, when that process is going to be announced, but it'll be here probably pretty soon, so that the competition in May is going to happen. But 95% of people that I heard, whether they were good players or less, less, um, less advanced players, they, um, they pretty much all did some things the same. 
So I actually, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it just for time's sake. I'm gonna try one, this one young man, Travis. Where are you? Where are you at? Affectation, no. When the line goes up, 
play to the dynamic. Sing up. When the line goes down, come away. It, it, it makes a lot of sense because if you understand that the function, uh, the function that tessitura has on dynamics of a brass instrument, it has a built-in crescendo when you play up. You notice I don't have a crescendo written up for the high E. It's going to happen anyway. But I hear people sit there and beat their head against the wall. So I wonder. Oh, we'll do it on another excerpt. But on this excerpt. <coughs> Now this is gonna this is gonna be a, a terrible statement. I'm going to take your responsibility off the wood. Can you hear that? Nobody can hear that in the water. Here's you saw version one that I hear all the time. Here's version two. Play it kind of like a, like an you know an evolved 
pseudo player do on the right. Right? How many times have you heard that excerpt and thought, oh, wait a minute, 
If I didn't know, I think the bar line was on that first seat, and all the other seven <coughs> got it, uh, got it uh, eights or tied notes. But it's not. It's not. And, and when people play it that way, it sounds unstylistic because it doesn't sound, it's not in the character of Berlioz. And it changes the, it changes the time around so that it sounds like kind of like a syncopated uh, march that's hard for the listeners to digest. So let me, rather than playing it, well, I'll play it the slow way. Here's, here's a half equals 88. And then, as they go further and further throughout the excerpt, they just get louder and louder and louder in the tessitura where it's the absolutely hardest to, to come up with a whole other dynamic. They just sit there and, and I, I am going to be a little bit facetious when I play this because I hear it like this all the time. Bang in a little bit loud for safety's sake. 
and then they have to breathe a lot. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to take every one of these breathing opportunities, but you've seen where I, I, I see it. Now, then you see you get to this low B, and I've written a line in it because they sustain that forte dynamic all the way out, or at least they try to. And then the next, you know, the next places that they play, like a measure after, was it five, rehearsal five, it sounds like they're playing at the manual window, but that's just because they're not being smart about the role that tessitura has on a perceived dynamic. The middle register is always going to sound loud. So if you play a scale downwards and you don't do anything different, it will sound like a mini window, whether you want it to or not. Okay, so here's half equal 66.
wasn't ideal, but that was, you get the idea. Even even so, with a little bit being late on those quarter notes, marching out of the end, you know that there's a big difference. Now, I hope that it's been uh, 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 enlightening, and I hope that it makes you think about these things that some of going on addition. So it's no longer a bunch of question marks. Now, you can reflect on how you approach and hopefully be more successful if I can help you in any way. Thanks, guys.